okay, so, so that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in exploring is what happens as our technology changes our, our body plan and the kind of signals we're getting back from embodied cognition. I'll give you another example. This is a, a gentleman that I recently met in New York at a conference. He lost his arm in an accident and he got this beautiful prosthetic arm put on. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was by a company here in San Antonio that makes these arms. So, um, uh, but here's the thing. What Nigel can do if you ask him to, uh, to turn his hand, here's what it looks like. So you say, okay, Nigel, turn your hand to the right or the left. He just keeps turning it. He keeps turning it. What this means is, what this means is that Nigel can think thoughts that you can't think. Like, keep going, right? Keep it going. He, he can just keep rotating all day long if he wants. Or, you know, the thought of, okay, put in a light bulb with one motion, right? He can... <laughs> You can't think that thought. Okay, now Nigel's arm happens to be hooked up to the remaining nerves and muscles in his, in his upper arm, but what's happening now is people are really developing technologies uh, of what's called brain-machine interfaces or brain-computer interfaces where you plug it straight into the brain. So it's the signals from the brain are controlling the peripheral device, and, and this allows us to be able to really build better machinery in some cases than what Mother Nature gave us. Now this has been really, um, these principles have been undergoing a process of perfection in non-human primates for, for, for really over a decade now. But what's happening recently is now this is happening in humans, so it's not just for monkeys anymore. Humans are getting these sorts of things where their brain signals are directly controlling these peripheral devices. Now, here's one of the speculations that I'm writing about in my, in my next book uh, for next year is this idea that once this has been, once these principles are really underway and perfected, the thing is, Mother Nature is great at dealing with muscle and sinew and tendons and stuff like that, but Mother Nature never came up with Bluetooth. And I was thinking, what if you could actually just associate this stuff and have what I'm calling a telelimb? So, so the idea is you could control things at a distance. Now, now here's the important philosophical point that I'm, that I'm unpacking in the book is that it turns out that what you can control is what you understand as the self. So my brain can control this meat robot, and so I think of this as myself, and this is my limb. But if I can control a limb across the way, if it were correlated with my thoughts every time I wanted to move and it moved, that would equally be a part of myself. And the only reason we're not used to it is, as I said, because we're not, because Mother Nature didn't invent these long distance things that we've come up with. But there's no reason that we can't really build that sort of thing. And if we can have a telelimb, you could actually have you know, a complete brain-controlled avatar, which is to say, by measuring your brain, this is not, I mean, this is in the future. This is not something we have right now. But you could, in theory, have a brain-controlled avatar where you're controlling an entire body all the way across the room that's doing the heavy lifting, or an avatar that goes off to the moon or Mars and, and does travels for you, but you're actually controlling it, it's predictable, its motions are predictable, so instead of being a meat robot, it's just a metal robot, and, and it becomes part of the self. Okay, now, so that's the thing about controlling telelimbs, but there's one other way that I want to mention about the way in which uh, our technology is getting melded with our biology in a useful way, which is that you can actually, people are working with ways of doing um, artificial parts of the brain. So for example, let's say that a part of your brain, like the hippocampus, is degenerating. So um, Ted Berger's lab has come up with, with an artificial hippocampus now. And so the idea is, um, if parts of the hippocampus are going away, that thing you see, the rectangular thing you see at the top there, is reading signals from the input to the hippocampus, and then manipulating those signals and putting them into the output in the same way that the biological hippocampus does. So in, so, you, so in other words, it's just circumventing it. It's doing the same computations as the biological piece, but it's doing it in silica. And this seems like science fiction, but this is actually going on right now. It's been implanted in at least one uh, patient that I know of who, who went in there because he's got epilepsy, he's got problems in his hippocampus uh, that make it epileptic, and so they're gonna cut out part of it, and so they're just circumventing it. Um, now, what I think is really, of course, amazing about this, beyond its normal amazingness, is that, you know, not only can you replace degrading parts, but we can really think about, you know, making it better, making the whole thing better, putting in coprocessors so that, I mean, you know, obviously the, you know, Google and so on becomes a brain coprocessor, but imagine 
having that inside where you've just got a lot more horsepower. You're essentially increasing the size of your hard drive and your RAM in a, in a big way, right? And this, I, the thing I need to emphasize is this sounds like science fiction, but, but this stuff's already, already starting. And, you know, when we think about the pace of technology, you know, there are people alive today at the age of 100 who have seen the world go from horse and buggy to the internet, right? I mean, things are changing fast, and they're only going to start changing faster. So I think this is right around the corner. And there's an interesting philosophical speculation that I want to pose here as we're thinking about this issue of replacing parts of the brain as they get you know, uh, pathologic or just simply as they get old or just simply if we want to improve them, which is some of you may know about the story of the ship of Theseus, which is that, you know, Theseus uh, captained this ship. It was docked in, in Greece. And, uh, and over time, uh, every plank of the ship was replaced with a new plank multiple times. And so the ship of Theseus has all new pieces and parts. And so the question is, is it still the ship of Theseus? That's the question that philosophers ask, right? But I think the same thing is going to be applying here as we talk about replacing pieces and parts of our brain. Not for our generation, but, you know, 90 years from now, when you can go in and say, you know, I want an upgraded hippocampus. I want the new, you know, thalamus from Apple that's better, and so on. The que this is what I'm going to call the, the ship of Mesius, which is, is it still me if I've replaced all the pieces and parts? And I think when we talk about this issue of the future of being human, this is really one of the, one of the questions that, that takes us down that path. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap up here in just a moment. I just want to say, um, when I was in school, I studied um, some amount of philosophy. And one of the philosophers I was impressed with was a guy named Jacques Derrida, a French philosopher. But he had this notion that really struck me at the time. He said, look, Fundamentally, all our technology, it's just gadgetry. When you put down your cell phone and you close your eyes and you think about the things that are important to you, you know, your loves, your fears, your hopes, things like that, he said, it's the same as somebody living a 1,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago. All of that doesn't change, and all of this technology, it's just gadgetry. Now, I was compelled by that for a while, but after putting together tonight's talk, I decided, I don't think it's true anymore. And here's why I think it's not true. It's because the technology is now getting married with us, and it changes our umwelt. It means that as you fast forward the several decades, what we're talking about is when you close your eyes, you're actually a different person entirely. I mean, as our technology keeps going, not, you know, in terms of the sensory input and the hearts we have, and the, the limbs and the telelimbs that we have, and the brain coprocessors that we have, I don't think we're going to be the same anymore. And essentially what this comes down to is, I think that our distant descendants are going to be cognitive strangers to us. They're not going to understand the things that were important to us and our loves and hopes and dreams and aspirations because they're just going to be really different. In the same way, on a, a smaller scale, in the same way that we read Beowulf, and you know we get it, we read it for historical interest, but it doesn't have much resonance with us now in our time because we have much richer experiences than our ancestors did. We're already changing somewhat, but when technology really gets married in there, I think all the things that are important to us are really going to, to be different. And, you know, as an undergraduate, I majored in Shakespeare, and I took a lot of courses on Shakespeare, who, who remains my, my favorite writer. I think he's the greatest writer we've had in the English language. Um, his contemporary, Ben Jonson, when Shakespeare died, uh, his contemporary wrote that Shakespeare was not of an age, but for all time. Now, as much as I love Shakespeare in, during my lifetime, I had just tonight started wondering if this is actually true. Because, you know, think about 100 years from now when my great-great-great-granddaughter can just put in neural implants and experience a, a, an emotional depth of experience that's 10 times greater than what you can get by sitting for three hours and watching a play. Is it really true that, uh, that anything lasts for all time? Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop my talk there because I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it.